Good evening. Well, I've lost my pen. Turn to someone and smile and say, I'm glad to see you. I'm glad that y'all are doing that now naturally and it's not uh, uh, a strange thing to you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Amen to that. And I am glad to be here with you tonight. Uh, it is a blessing. As we, uh, before we open our Bibles and continue our study in the book of Philippians chapter 4, using that as a guide as we continue to think about a topic of study that we could go in many places in the Bible. But our topic of study is how to behave as a Christian. And it's always easy to me, I have to be careful to not go all the way back to beginning and review back through. I don't want to do that. I don't have time to do that. In fact, I've got to talk to Jonathan soon about uh, when uh, we're going to tag again, because uh, if I'm going to finish this, I'm going to have to hurry up. Uh, so before we get into that tonight, as we are continuing, uh, if we behave like Christians, then there are things that characterize us. Not just things we do, but things that characterize our behavior, our thoughts, our attitude, our, our very lives. And we're using Philippians 4, the first 10, 11 verses, to help us uh, understand those things. But before we do that, there are a number of people who are on our um, sick list, in our bulletin, um, in our announcements. But there may be others uh, that we need to mention again. I appreciate your prayers for um, Miss Dorothy, my mother-in-law. She's back uh, in the nursing home from the hospital. Um, it, give me somebody if we need to put them on our list for our class. As we, uh, and I hope you carry those names with you. Well, Tommy Barragona, we you know, will be going to the heart doctor tomorrow to see what they're going to do. Uh, you know... Tommy is one of those people um, that you meet, and uh, he, he asked me how I was doing. I said, I'm doing pretty good. I'm tired. How are you? Oh, I'm great. i got to meet with the heart surgeons tomorrow to see what they're going to do, but I, I, I'm great. Uh, I appreciate his attitude. Uh, who else do we need to put on our list? Nina Morrison. Nina Morrison. Brenda Jacobs. Sandy Bonham. I don't know if you can write that thing. I am shorty, but I can't write that thing. Sandy Bonham. Okay. And who was the one after nine? Brenda Jacobs. Yes, yeah, Brenda Jacobs. Of course, we need to remember Brenda Jacobs. Who did you say? Somebody over here. Uh, Madison Johnson. Madison Johnson. Brenda Don Dawson. My sister in law, Linda Harwood. Say that again. Linda Harwood. Linda or Linda? Harwood. Harwood, okay. That's her sister, Amy. Rachel Daniels. Rachel Daniels. Haley Farr. Haley? Haley. Haley, excuse me. And I want to clarify, did you say Glenda Harwood? Okay, good. And Brenda and Don? Dawson. Pat and Gerald Gray, their family. Pat and Gerald Gray. Paula Warner and June Cupper. Calvin Barber. Calvin Barber. 
What's going on with Calvin? Well, he'd had surgery and he fell this morning and now they think he may be septic. Oh. Anyone else? Brandy Moore? Brandy Moore, of course. George Doris family. George passed away. Okay. Freddie McCrary, my brother. Okay. He's in the hospital in Tupelo. He is not doing well. They're almost going to put him on a ventilator, but we haven't. <coughs> Craig McQuarrie, that's what you said. Craig McQuarrie, that's what you said. Anyone else? One of the things that we're going to talk about uh, is when we finish this next, the next one we get to is uh, verse 6, which goes very deeply into prayer and the importance of prayer. Uh, and one of the things, uh, I write these down, uh, I, did, I do that, so I'll remember. Um, but like many of you, you know when I remember this list again? When I open this book on Wednesday night. So I've decided to start doing something. I'm going to, as soon as I take this out and I say we, we pray, I'm going to put this in my pocket so that I can do it at least one more time. Now, will I do that perfectly? No, probably not. But I hope that you will try to call to mind the people that we remember. You don't have to remember their names. But God has a better memory than any of us. Uh, but let's pray. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for listening, and for loving us. We are so mindful of your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your son, Jesus, for his willing sacrifice on the cross. We are thankful that you allow us the privilege of prayer to thank you for your goodness and your blessings. And for that, we give you the glory and the honor, as well as our thanksgiving. But Father, there are many of our congregation who are sick. And there are many who are on the hearts and minds and in the association of the members of this class. And Father, we bring those people before you tonight. And we pray that you'll be with Tommy Baragona and Nina Morrison. And you'll be with Brenda and Sandy. And Madison Johnson. The Dawsons. With Glenda Harwood and Rachel Dawson with Ellie Farr, with Pat and Gerald Gray, with Randy Moore and June Cupper and Sister Warner, the uh, George Doris family, with Calvin Barber and Freddie McQuarrie. And Father, I know that I probably didn't say those names exactly as they are. But you smile down because you know their needs far better than I would ever remember their names. And we submit those lives to you, Father. They have various needs and various difficulties and are facing different days ahead. Be with those who love them and those who care for them and in accordance to your will, supply what you can, what they need, that they might be blessed. As we study your word tonight, help us to be humble students in your son's name, I pray. Amen. Would you open your Bible to Philippians 4? And we're going to read the first four verses again. And uh, for time, I almost, for time's sake, think about just leaving part of this off. But then I think, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, because it's there and it's important. And I'm not going to just include the section I said we'd talk about tonight. Uh, just because it's there. It doesn't address behavior, but yet it does. It's the end of verse 3. So, would a volunteer read uh, the first four verses again to refresh them in our minds? Therefore, my brothers 
and my love and long for my joy and crown. Stand firm thus in the Lord my beloved. I entreat Yodia, I entreat Sintiki to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Thank you. It's that last part of verse 3 that I want us to think about. If we are behaving as God would have us to behave, then we are busy. We're busy in the sense that we are about the business. As Jesus said when he was only 12 years old, I must be about my father's business. And then later he said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is uh, day for the night comes in which no man can work. So it's always been a theme of our Lord to be busy about the work of the kingdom. And we find that in this passage, but it is, we, we've come down to that last phrase, fellow workers, we talked about it, whose names are written in the book of life. We could easily just keep going as that is a, as though that were an afterthought. Well, yes, if you're a worker, you're a worker of the Lord, a fellow worker in the kingdom, laboring together, you're in the book of life. But what I'd like for us to do for just a few minutes is take from that understanding a powerful reassurance, a powerful reassurance of the blessing that it, that it is to be a, a worker in the kingdom, to be one of God's laborers, one of his children who are laboring and who are uh, working side by side with one another. Not just the fact that my name is checked off. In fact, I want to talk about that a little bit. But this idea of the book of life, three times in the New Testament. And I gave you some homework to read those verses uh, in Revelation and think about them. So tell me what you think. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Verses 12 through 15. We're going to read three passages here uh, to begin. And I want us to, what, what I, my goal here is for us to go away with a firm understanding of what the book of life is or what it means to be written in the book of life, perhaps is a better way to put that. But let that firm understanding create within us a renewed encouragement, a renewed sense of who we are, because that's important. That's very important. Okay, would someone read Revelation 20, verses 12 through 15? And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, notice the, the obvious connection here. Notice the contrast. First of all, uh, the judgment scene is what's being depicted, what, what's being shown to us. And, and we talked about this verse in our study Sunday night. The books, obviously, are the, uh, the books of the gospel, the books of scripture, the books of truth, by which our lives are lived and by which they'll be judged. But notice that the second death being cast into the lake of fire is, uh, the, is equivalent to the second death. It is the second death. And those who were being judged based on how they lived, one of two places. Either cast out into the lake of fire or those who have their names written in the book of life. So hold that thought and turn with me to Revelation 21.
and verse 27. Okay, now someone, I'm trying to wait until all the pages stop turning. Someone read that one. Not all at once now. Oh, I'm sorry, did I tell you where? 21, 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything of the power. Neither whatsoever works of abomination or make them alive, save with the written of the lamb to keep the Okay, okay. Now read that last person. Uh, part again. The they which are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The they written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now notice the contrast. Those who are, again, outside, and those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay. Now go to Revelation chapter 3. And we're going somewhere with this. Revelation chapter 3. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Can you hear me too okay? I sound like, okay. Chapter 3 and verse 5 of Revelation. Y'all are shy tonight. What's going on? The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garment. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father, before his angels. Okay. What I'm wanting you to see is the identity and the surety and the assurance and the confidence and the blessing of being written in the Lamb's book of life. I want to make a comment about it and, and kind of get your opinion. But look at verse 5 again. Thank you for reading that. The one who conquers. Oh, that reminds me of, uh, um, well, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, no. I have, uh, we are more than conquerors. That's Romans. Sorry, I had a moment. Uh, we conquer. We're more than, uh, God has given us the uh, victory. That's 1 Corinthians 15. He's given us the victory through our faith. We are more than conquerors, Paul said. Now, watch this. Hmm? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, notice what he says. You know what? Uh, I love the ESV, but it had little bitty numbers. The one who conquers will be clothed, thus in white garments. Purity. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Okay, think about that for a minute. Sometimes, and, and again, here's the opinion part. You, you can say, and you may say, I'm not sure I see it that way. Uh, but this is just my concern. My concern is that if we're not careful because we, we um, the Lord, the New Testament... God, through the Holy Spirit, gives us often things that are tangible, things that we can wrap our, our, our heads around. Just like Jesus said, a sower went out to sow and the birds devoured, and we can wrap our heads around it. The book of life, if we're not careful, we get the wrong impression. Almost as bad as the eye of someone floating on a cloud in a too short white robe and, and plucking on some instrument, and that's heaven. Uh, not even close. Not even close. The book of life is not some old, moldy, crusty book and God, some elderly figure who writes my name and scratches it out and writes my name and scratches it out and writes my name. If you're not careful, that almost gives it a comedic, a comical, but there's nothing comical about it. This word blot has the idea of... of uh, smearing something out, obliter 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 wiping it away. I can't say that word. Completely. Oh, that's right. It most certainly does. He says that I will never blot your name out. But notice when that is. That's 
on the other side on, uh, in eternity. But the idea is, it, it's, does that mean that we can't be blotted out? Oh, we certainly can. But it, that doesn't mean that every time we, we make a mistake that God has written us off. And No, because we have an advocate. Remember 1 John? 1 John 1 and verse 7. This idea of the book of life is, is more intense, at least in, in my uh, humble opinion, because the idea, and I'll tell you why. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, remember what we just read in chapter 3, verse 5 of Revelation? He said, I will not blot him out of the book of life, but I will what? Confess his name before my Father. Now, there are two verses I want us to read, and I want you to take away a great confidence about this book of life. Luke 12 and verse 8. Somebody read it. Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man will also confess before the angels of God. Now go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. One of my favorite verses of Scripture, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19. I will, he who confesses me before men, that word confess has the idea of public acknowledgement, but it is a much deeper word than simply public acknowledgement. It has the idea, that word confess in Luke 12, 8, has the idea of assigning your, or, or um, siding yourself with. You are verbally saying, I am on this side. I belong to. I am in uh, uh, complete agreement with. Uh, it is a, a commitment sort of confession, not just a simple verbal acknowledgement. It's deeper than that. It's almost like, well, somebody read 2 Timothy 2 19. Everybody will confess him Absolutely. But will all those people be saved? No. That's right. So this confession is not merely saying, you're God, because I have no other option, uh, obviously, you, you, uh, that I believe in Christ. But I believe in Christ to the deepest level of commitment, that I'm willing to be that servant, that laborer, that worker. Read 2 Timothy 2.19. God's firm foundation stands, bearing his seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Notice how those, the principles stack on each other there. The firm foundation of God stands. That's enough. But what's next? Having this seal. Okay, the firm foundation stands. And it has a seal. What's the seal? That the Lord knows those who are His. You know, sometimes, have you ever felt like God has forgotten who you are? You don't have to answer that. But if you're a human being, you have. You ever wondered that, uh, you, uh, is God, does He really know what's going on? Does He have any idea what's happening? And it, He does. God knows those who are His. So when you think about being a fellow worker whose name is written in the book of life, that is not merely say, oh, uh, that's right, I've got a badge that says I'm a, I've got a check mark. No. To have your name written in the book of life is to say, is for God to say, I know, I know Jonathan Farr. And sometimes we want to be cute and say, um, yeah, I know, God says, I know Jonathan Farr, we're tight. I know Jonathan Farr, he belongs to me. I know him inside and out. And I know you. That's very powerful. I, he knows us and we're written in his book. Why though? Because we are fellow workers in the kingdom. So we can read that and think, well, that's just 
that's a nice sentiment, Paul. No, Paul didn't write that as a nice sentiment. He wrote that as a, a, a uh, um, establishing point of encouragement to, to solidify uh, who, they, uh, who they were, their identity. Okay, qu comments. I'm talking way too much. I think there's a couple things. Just, this is observation. This isn't from the Bible per se. But I have noticed over the years that if I ask my quote-unquote Christian friends are they going to heaven, they have the utmost assurance that they do. And they base it on these verses. But I know a lot of members of the church, you ask that same question, they go, I hope so or I think so. And I never have understood why we don't have that confidence. And I think sometimes we over-teach the falling from grace, that we don't enjoy the fact of the confidence of knowing that we're sealed and we're His. And I think that hurts us in some ways because I think when you have confidence that you have salvation, you're more confident to share it with other people. Absolutely. And, and of course, at no time, Jonathan, does that ever mean that uh, there is a difference? You know, what is the uh, uh, not very far from confidence is overconfidence. And so you all, you're always aware of that because the third verse of Romans 12 that says, offer your, uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Verse 3 says, and don't forget who you are and think more highly of yourself. Yes, sir. Romans 8 14 says, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. Verse 16 says, The Spirit himself by the witness last year, we are his children. We are children of God. <clears throat> so as long as we're walking in the light, our book written in the book of life. Yes, and that's equivalent to <coughs> being written in the book of life. Uh, and no, and then, yes, sir. When Jesus was uh, writing to the church there in Sardis in Revelation 3 and verse 4, he said there were some there that had reason to be confident. He called them worthy. Yes. Sorry. It's not because, see, I think that's very important. It's not because they were worthy. You know, it's interesting how things happen sometimes. And uh, don't go out of here and say that God sent me this fortune cookie because I don't believe that. Uh, but it is an interesting coincidence. Uh, Lisa and I neither have had a chance to go home this afternoon. Um, so we stopped and got a little something to eat. And I got this for, uh, he said, some of you are thinking, surely he's not going to read that fortune cookie. Yes, it fits, okay? But uh, I'll tie it together. If, that's the, if you only get one thing out of this lesson, don't let it be this, okay? But think about what Jim said just a second ago. Um, they're worthy, but they weren't worthy because of their own worthiness. They were worthy because of who to whom they belonged. And they were doing what they did because of whom, to whom they belong. Now notice that's backwards uh, than the way we think about it. They weren't worthy because of the works they did. They did the works they did because of whom, to whom they belong. And so this little fortune cookie uh, said, oh wait, that's not the right side. The great, are you laughing at me? The great and glorious masterpiece of man is how to live with purpose. You know, I read that and I thought, that's a nice sentiment. But wait a minute, did, I, did you hear that? The great and glorious masterpiece of man is how to live with purpose. And that's our problem, is that we want to make our lives into a grand masterpiece by living according to our own purpose. And that is absolutely, I better not throw that down, they'll get me. That's absolutely, what? No, I, you have to learn by now. I don't finish. I just pause. <laughs> Going back to the point uh, Jonathan made, I wonder sometimes too, you know, because I, I, I dwell, I've, I've thought about this a lot. You know, he's talking about, you know, you talk to like our quote Christian friends and use the air quote, and, you know, the, our, the, the religious world outside of the actual church membership of God. And, and, and they have this confidence that they're saved. I wonder though sometimes if that's not based a lot on their uh, 
false idea of, you know, well, all you got to do is believe and you're saved anyway, and, you know, accept the name Christ and I'm saved. And then there are a lot of, so many of them teach that, you know, you can't fall from grace. You're once saved, always saved. So I wonder if they don't have, obviously a lot of them, I do believe, have a false sense of security in their Christianity. And maybe that's why we as members of the church, you know, where we know that you can't fall from grace. We believe that. And we teach, you know, sin is sin. And sin can keep you away from God. That sometimes we maybe put, as John said, we might put too much emphasis on sometimes. But I think at the same time, too, if we don't put some emphasis on that, we can find ourselves getting complacent in our Christianity, in our spiritual life, and letting ourselves be maybe less focused on God and what we should be. Absolutely. Every verse, every word. That's why I think, you know, Paul didn't. He didn't describe these people as, as individuals whose names were written in the book of life simply as his style of writing. If, if that's the case, then we don't have word-for-word -word inspiration. We don't have something that's imported in every phrase, and we do. So, I, Personally, and I'm speaking strictly from, from my standpoint, my fear of sin taking me away from God is what keeps me every day trying to do the best I can. Now, do I fail? Yes. I know I do. But it's, it's that fear of sin taking me away from God that keeps me trying every day to do the best I can. And I don't see that in a lot of people who call themselves Christians and think they're saved and going to heaven. Sure. And I think you used the right word when you said complacency. Uh, complacency. Well, I think it's also important to remember that what the phrase whose names are written in the book of life was a, an adjective clause that was describing people who were called fellow workers, fellow laborers. So they, and it, they had, there was a motivation that moved them forward. Absolutely. about those two ladies back there in Philippians' behavior. And, and if you go back to the Sardis verse, uh, he said, you have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. He was focusing on their behavior. They took advantage of God's part when they became Christians, and that's who he's writing to. But once they became Christians, there's an expectation of behavior. And because they have not defiled their garments, he says that they are worthy. It is what they have done in the context that he's talking about here. I agree. And I personally, tell me what, tell me what you think. Uh, I think that these two ladies had not yet reached a point that they had defiled their garments or, or sinned. But obviously that was a concern of Paul because remember he said, along with whose names are written. They were still considered, but they were treading on, on a banana peel. yes, they, they were, uh, and, and, which is a good lesson for us. We, we can all uh, start down a road and, and here's a, a bold statement a very bold statement um, is that I wonder what I wonder what a blessing it would be if we had people in our lives who would be willing how do I need to say this who would be willing to bend our ear about our behavior before it became so obvious that everybody knew about it when we started getting too close to the banana. We hadn't even stepped on it yet, but we are definitely getting a little off kilter. You ever thought about that? You know, good friends can do that. Uh, I have, uh, I am fortunate, and I say this with no silliness. I have, I'm very fortunate to have been blessed with lots of great friends in, in Christ, but two best friends. Uh, I'm married to one and I co-direct A Week of Maywood with the other one. And he and I have been together uh, for so long that uh, um, 
uh, one example is I got frustrated one time about some silliness that was going on and um, I was being a little silly and he said, you're acting like a child, go to bed. I said, oh, okay. Uh, and that was the end of it. Uh, but not a lot of us can say that to one another. Maybe we should be able to say that. That, hey, chill out. It's not, relax. does that make sense? It makes me think of, this verse that we were talking about makes me think of all of this. Philippians 2 and verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You're not earning anything, but you're doing what you're doing because of who you are and where you are and how you've been transformed. So work out your own salvation. Following his plan. The masterpiece is what God is doing for you. And you're following his purpose, not your own. You're not trying to create your own masterpiece. You're working out your salvation by doing your part so that your name is written in the book of life. So I think you're absolutely right. He was concerned about these ladies, uh, which is an interesting... It makes me wonder where verse 4 falls here. Uh, verse 4 is the next one that we're going to talk about. We'll just be able to start it. Number 5. Uh, when, I believe, when I behave as a Christian ought to behave, I am happy as a Christian ought to be. Now, the word happy, I underlined this a couple of times in my notes because I thought about changing it. Because the more I study, the more I don't like the use of the word happy. However, I decided to leave it because what maybe needs to happen is not our changing the word, but changing our understanding of the word or the meaning of the word. Uh, if we are Christians... Should we be happy? It's an easy question to ask and probably an easy question to answer. But is it always the case? Let's talk about happiness just for a second. We're about to run out of time. Um, what is your definition of happiness? I've got a couple of dictionary definitions here. Uh, here's a good one. Uh, happiness, the quality or state of being happy. Uh, that's kind of going around in circles. Um, good fortune, pleasure, contentment, joy, uh, enjoying. If you're happy, you show uh, pleasure, you, you show satisfaction, joy. Okay, but what is your definition of happy and happiness? Before we dig into the word rejoice in this verse, which is an interesting word. Now, wait a minute. With this many people, you mean nobody in this room can give me a definition of happy? Contented. What? State of mind. State of mind. Wait a minute. You're suggesting happiness has to do with a, a frame of mind and a, and a, a way of life? Sure. It does, doesn't it? It's exactly what it sounds like. So I wait, I have to do something to be happy? You think a lot of people want to be happy and they just kind of wait for it to happen to them? They, somebody has, do, do a lot of people define happiness as something that has to be done to them or for them in order for them to be happy? But you will never find that in the Bible. It's something we have to do. Okay, so how would you answer this question before we stop tonight? What does it take to make a person truly happy? What is the secret of happiness? First of all, you got to be in the Lord. So First of all, you got to be in the Sorry. Say that again without me talking. I said, first of all, you got to be in the Lord. You okay. said, rejoice in the Lord. That's right. So we, should Lord. Be, we should be happy if you're we're Christians if we're all right with the Lord. There's no reason to be anything other than happy. Okay. Very good. Anybody else? Love God and 
keep his commandments. Love God and keep his commandments. I think, I think verse 11 has explained that. Not that I speak in respect to woman, for I have learned in whatever state I am, there to be content. Absolutely. Um, over and over and over in the scriptures, not just in yes, but absolutely point out that happiness is not something that we create, but it's something that we have because of how we live. Now, I want to uh, check that last phrase just a little bit because we do have a responsibility because the word rejoice in this verse is a verb that we have to do. So, yes, sir? I was just thinking about the Beatitudes. You know, that Jesus teaching, if that blessed means happy, I mean, it really challenges our thinking about what happy is. Yes, it, yes, it does. Because that word blessed, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's going to, uh, by now you know I love to study words. Uh, the word rejoice the, is connected to the word blessed in Matthew 5 which really changes the way we see Matthew 5 uh, and the Beatitudes. So uh, we're, I'm just getting warmed up, and, uh, and it's time to go. Um, so I, don't, I, I always keep this. I, I went and got it because I knew I don't want any of you to be like, uh, have I told you the story what the little boy did to Alan Webster? Have I? No? Do you all know who Alan Webster is? Very much. Uh, great gospel preacher, but he was preaching in a meeting where I uh, was preaching in Corinth, and he held a meeting for us. There was a little boy on front. You know how parents will sometimes, any of you ever uh, kind of pacified your kids by letting them draw, or maybe, and this mother was real happy because he, she wanted to, he was wanted to write words, so she'd write words, and she wouldn't pay any attention, and, and he, you know, he spelled out the word stop. And he held it up to Alan. <laughs> Alan got so tickled he, he, he couldn't keep preaching because this little boy's on the second row and he, this big, he holds it up. So I don't want anybody to hold me up a sign. Uh, thank you and have a blessed night.